directly related to the subject of the conference, but I gave two years ago, I think, a conference in honor of Samson, uh, a talk which was more connected, and I would say for my excuse that the methods which I will use here are essentially related to uh, the ones I used in that talk. So I will speak about coherent chiefs, <coughs> Chan character, and Rimanor Grotenti. So this will be an uncompromising, I would say, mathematical talk, but I will try to give at some point some ideas of the intuition which comes in the proofs and which is directly related in some sense to physics. So this is joint work with Susan and <coughs> So here is the organization of the talk. And let me explain the purpose of the talk. So if I give myself x to be a compact <coughs> complex manifold, as you know, there is the Durham operator, there is the Debar operator, Dolbo operator, whose square vanishes. So on such compact manifolds, you have the notion of a holomorphic vector bundle. So you give yourself a vector bundle, and besides <coughs> it has an anti-holomorphic connection that's an operator which is essentially looks locally like the Debar operator and with square vanishes. And that's a fundamental result of Newlander and Nuremberg that if you give yourself conversely an operator of, D, of this kind with square vanishes, then locally by gauge transformation you can go back to the case of the Debar operator. So this is a holomorphic vector bundle. So we will talk in some sense during the lecture, there will be more general operators of this kind whose square vanishes. But the basic difference with this case of the just the connection will be that this operator will typically have an expansion in the degrees in the anti-holomorphic form. So in other words, this will be a matrix-valued operator, but it will not only contain a form of degree 1, it will start actually with degree 0, degree 1, degree 2, degree 3, and so on, and its square will vanish. And it turns out that such objects describe analytically more general objects than holomorphic vector bundles. They describe actually a, an object which is called a core and sheaf in mathematics, and in some sense, their use will be that we will be able ultimately to construct the so-called Chun character for such objects, these covalent sheaves, and finally give an index formula, which in this case will be a riemann rohr grotendieck formula. So the question of constructing the Chun character for covalent sheaves has been open, I would say, for 40 years or 50 years. I mean, it was just described already by a paper by Atia and Hirtzebuch a long time ago. And it's interesting to see that in some sense objects which are closely related to physics in a way will give us the proper solution. It just, just uh, can we go back for one second? Yes. So, uh, uh, so that D-bar in the second bullet, that, that's a slightly different D-bar, it's not the one D-bar up. No, it's not the same, but locally, I, I wrote here, locally, you can get a gauge transformation. No, but still, it's on the section of the bundle, not on the manifold. That's right, that's, that's absolutely right, yes. So you have the D-bar as a model, and locally, you say, locally, this vector bundle is direct sum of C to the K, and on which the D-bar acts. Uh, uh, yeah, and so and the so, connection and the holomorphic structure is not e equivalent, right? Yes, it, it's the same. So it you give equivalent. yourself a vector bundle <coughs> with a number e second whose square vanishes, then it is holomorphic. That is, locally you can find holomorphic sections. And so it is CK equipped with a D bar operator. Okay. Okay, that's the Newlander, Nuremberg, giving yourself an operator which vanishes, whose square vanishes. It says that locally, you can write this vector bundle as c to the k equipped with a t bar operator. But complex structure is already introduced, or it introduces on, on complex manifold. structure. 
Uh, on the manifold, on the it's manifold. introduced, but not on the vector not bundle. Okay, the vector bundle actually turns out to be locally CK equipped with the bar operator. So it's not like I introduce a homomorphic structure in vector bundle and it induces a homomorphic structure. On no, the no, no, no. Okay, you give That's yourself the operator. Are different. Okay. They're not really. It's it's very good that you insist on this point because this come back. This point will come back recurrently uh, in a more complicated, sophisticated context. Is it? Yeah. So, first of all, let me go to the elementary, sort of elementary case, vector bundles and churn character. So we'll move, first of all, in the smooth category for vector bundles, and then we will complicate the situation to go to more general case. So, I give myself x to be a compact manifold. Okay, k0 of x, if you like, just take the collection of smooth vector bundles. Okay, so forget about the k-group here. That means that you have direct sum operations. You have a total sum operations which are encoded in this k0 of x. But forget about that. So then, we have a churn character map which goes from the k0 of x to the even cohomology of x. That's the so-called churn character. Okay, so... In concrete terms, this is something that you know very well. If you give yourself a vector bundle with a connection, let's say with unitary connection to make things clearer, nabla E, then there is a certain churn character form associated with it, which is an even form, and which is closed and represents the churn character in the cohomology of X. So basically, this cohomology class does not depend on the connection. That's the main result of Turnbill theory. So our churn character now will take values in a more refined cohomology than usual. I will say it in words. If you look at usual cohomology, you code them by exact forms. You ignore, you just look at closed forms and you ignore the exact forms. In Bonschen cohomology, you ignore a more refined object. You ignore d bar d exact forms. So, let me make the definition a little bit more formal. Give yourself x to be a compact complex manifold, and you introduce the drum complex, which is now bi -grade. Any form has an anti-homomorphic degree, dz bar, and degree dz, pq. So, what is the HPQ BC bot churn? It's the quotient of PQ closed forms, but you quotient them by the image of D bar D forms. Okay, so in usual cohomology, you just quotient by exact forms. Here you quotient by D bar D exact forms. So, if X is scalar, then the two cohomology theories are the same. Essentially, even though this looks more refined, these two sort of cohomology groups are the same in general. And this is already non-obvious. This HBC is a finite dimension. So it's finite dimensional because there is implicitly a sort of refined Hodge theory whose harmonic objects correspond to the cohomology, so that's one way of proving it that it's finite dimensional, and that's an algebra, exactly like the cohomology. And this algebra in general, for general compact complex manifolds, is strictly finer than the Durham cohomology. It contains extra information. As I mentioned before, if X is scalar the information, there is no, nothing gained by looking at Bob-Chern cohomology. Well, I mean, it, there, sh there should be something gained, no? Because it's, uh, you have P and Q, so I mean, yeah, you have more yeah, P information. Yeah, P and Q, but in Kayla case, okay, in, in Kayla that's you have also P, Q, so, 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 so that's exactly the way that you identify the, the groups, right? I mean, in Kayla case, you have also splitting of cohomology. And, and how, but so that also means you can recover the Durant cohomology in the general case. You can recover, yes, yeah. so there's a functor, there is a map, okay. So you know how to do it. You get a map, so it's refined, it's a strict refinement. And I will introduce this H equal, which is just a direct sum of the HPP in equal degree. Oh, 
So, holomorphic vector bundles and Schoen vector. So I give myself now x to be a compact complex vector bundle. Oh, so x compact complex might be four. And E nabla E second a holomorphic vector bundle. So I introduce uh, D to be a Hermitian metric on E. And then you can define the so-called churn connection, which is canonically associated with nabla E second and the metric. That unitary connection. Its curvature RE is a form of type 1, 1. Then, as you see, because the curvature is of type 1, 1, you look at the churn corrector form. Now, I wrote it in terms of the curvature again. Trace of exponential or minus the curvature, and suitably normalized. And that's a form which is a sum of forms of type PP. <coughs> RE is of type 1, 1. So it's a closed form. However, there is a result which was proved a long time ago by Bott and Chern, which says that the Bott-Chern cohomology class of this object does not depend on the metric. OK, so usually chern bale theory tells you that this form, its cohomology class does not depend on the connection. Here, we have a similar thing, but it's the Bottchen cohomology class, which does not depend on the metric. And this allows you to define a Chen character mapping holomorphic vector bundles into the Bottchen cohomology. That is CHBC. And this CHBC obviously refines on the classical Chen Chen character. And you can define other classes like Tor or BC. So, so these Borchen classes are not written as uh, uh, traces of powers of curvature. The Chen class is trace of exponential. Yes. The Borchen class will not be written like that? It will be written like that, but the Chen classes themselves take values in the refined cohomology. Same, but in a different cohomology. Okay, it's a different cohomology. It's something which is a little bit above. Okay. It's still finite dimensional, but it's a bond. So we will slightly <laughs> complicate the situation now. We will look at the so-called holomorphic complex of vector bundles, EV. So what means holomorphic vector bundle, complex of vector bundles? That means that you give yourself E0, E1, EM, holomorphic vector bundles, exactly as like before. And you give yourself also a chain map, a morphism, V, at each point. And you assume that this V squares to 0, like in cohomology, V squared. But also V is holomorphic. That's a so-called holomorphic complex of vector bundles. Complex because there is x to a z rating. And then I introduce a new differential which consists in combining the holomorphic connection, or this nabla E second, on each piece with the V. Okay, so in other words, you have the V which goes in this direction, and you have the nabla E second, which goes in the other direction. Of course, I make all these operators ultimately, ultimately this operator here, which is a sum, acts on smooth forms, smooth anti-holomorphic forms, with values in E. And this operator, E a second, its square vanishes. Its square still vanishes. If you square this, V square is equal to 0, nabla E second square vanishes, and the anti-commutator vanishes because V is holomorphic. You have to take care of science so that you, you get this. And so this way you get an operator, a second. That's a so-called OX complex, because this operator, a second, commutes with multiplication by local holomorphic functions. And I can look at its cohomology. So you have a complex. And you look at this cohomology. And what I mean here by looking at the cohomology means that I look at the local cohomology. 
I don't, not interested for the moment. Global cohomology, I'm just looking locally at the cohomology of this complex. And this way I get a sheaf that this so-called HE, that's a local sheaf, that the cohomology, take a small open set and try to find what is the cohomology of this. So, it's very easy to prove that to get this cohomology local, what you have to do instead is look locally at holomorphic sections of E. You look locally at things which are holomorphic in E. Sections of E, holomorphic, it vanishes under Nabla E second. You look at the action of V on this. V squared is equal to zero. And so I'm saying the cohomology of this HE is just the cohomology of this complex of holomorphic sections of E locally equipped with the differential V. Sorry, I missed V is a one form or it's in the zero, in, in, you have is the super connection which has different degrees. Yes, so, so, so you know, E second increases the degree by one so in the form direction. And, and V increases the degree by one in the E direction. Okay? okay? So the sum of the two increases the total degree by one. And it is this cohomology I'm interested in. So in a sense I have to think about this, that the X times a bundle, and in that X times a bundle I have a one form, which is V plus Nabla, then V has a component in, in X, and Nabla has component other way around in, in the... Yes, so you have to, obviously, to combine the two things. Okay, so we have a strange object, so the cohomology of this operator locally, it's the same as looking at holomorphic sections of E equipped with the chain map V. So this can get very, very complicated. Okay, is, is V is a complicated algebraic map, just algebraic functions. The cohomology of this chain map can be very complicated. It okay, can be very irregular. So, this HE is an example of what's called so-called z ring coherent sheaf. I will explain formally what is a coherent sheaf here, but you can think of it as being locally given by such a description. You take sections of E holomorphic, you have a chain map V, and you look at the cohomology of this. Obviously, in certain cases, this cohomology can be given itself by vector bundles, but in general, it's just a sheaf. So, I just give an example. The so-called causal complex, the simplest example. You take x equal to c. Well, it's not compact, of course. It's the generic coordinate z. And you look at the complex where c gives c, and v is just multiplication by z. So you see that this multiplication is invertible everywhere except at z equals 0. And I introduce this a second corresponding v plus d bar. In this case, the connection is just d bar, v plus d bar. And this he is just given, he in some sense is concentrated at 0. It's concentrated at 0 because v is invertible except at 0. So there is this idea of a cohomology which is locally concentrated at zero, and you can prove that this H in this case is so-called directive H, but let's forget about this, of C concentrated at zero, where I is the embedding of zero into C. So what are current sheaves? So by definition, an OX sheaf, so let's forget about formal definition of OX sheaves. OX means that holomorphic functions act on f is coherent if locally you can write f as being equal to h e. In other words, if the picture I gave before, which was global with this e and v and that last second, now it's just local. That's a coherent sheaf. So an example is that if you give yourself x, the manifold x, then the sheaf concentrated little x is coherent. Essentially, you know that by the causal complex I explained before. So, 
in the case of projective manifolds, that is essentially algebraic manifolds, essentially, if f is a coherent sheaf, this local description using EV can be globalized. That is, any coherent sheaf can be globally described in terms of the cohomology of such EV. In the general case, it's not the case. In the general case, if you have a coherent sheaf, you have this description, local description, local nice description, in terms of vector bundles, holomorphic connections, but this description cannot be globalized. There have been explicit counterexamples given by Clairvoisin. The most easy case for torus of them, high dimension than three, generic torus, non-projective, generic, you can prove that the simplest sheaf, the direct image of a point, he is not given. There is no EV global set that F is equal to H. So, what is the question of constructing the churn character for coherent sheaves now? May I ask a question before you? Yes. Now, what would go wrong, some naively, to think that that uh, superconnection has a curvature? Take the invariant polynomial traces of those curvatures and integrate over the base, over the manifold. Yes. Why would not they be a chain character? Because you do not have these vector bundles, okay? The, so, the data that you have to describe the sheaf, E, are only local. They don't globalize. They are just given local. I cannot integrate over the base? No. Okay. You cannot integrate because there is no vector bundle. Okay, if we were in the smooth category, if we're just thinking in usual Durham cohomology, there would not be problem. But in the holomorphic category, refiner, you cannot globalize it. It's as if you had a data which is given locally by certain piece, but you, know, you cannot globalize that. And do you know the abstraction to this? Yeah, I mean, at, at least uh, Claire Boisin in a uh, paper explained what was the, the abstraction is in certain narrow severy group. That's a complicated thing, but in general, you know that there are objects in which you cannot globalize this. So we still want to construct the Chan character in Botcher So actually, in the case where the manifold is projected, let's say if it is an algebraic manifold, then what you do, you take your sheaf, you write it as HE, where E is a vector bundle. Now, and you construct the Chan character for vector bundle. And you can prove that this construction does not depend on the way you write f is equal to hg. So you have f, you have an E global vector bundle or vector holomorphic complex. You construct the Chen character like in Chen veil theory, and you can prove that the construction does not depend on the choice. In but both Chen cohomology. In both Chen cohomology. In that case, what I propose standard thing works. So I it, just can't exactly. do that. In that case, you suggest standard. So for work. algebraic uh, case, it works. Thing works. It works. That's exactly the point that when you cannot do this, when there is no global way of piecing together these things into a homomorphic vector bundle, then you stop. And we have been stuck, I would say we mathematicians have been stuck for a long time. So I will try to explain how you can get out of this squid mine. So let me explain the definition of anti-holomorphic superconnections given by Jonathan Block. So I give myself now a vector bundle, which is Z-graded, but on which anti-holomorphic forms act naturally. So maybe to be less mathematical, I would say just take E to be the tensor product of the anti-holomorphic exterior algebra, this form oh, easy bar, tensed with D, where D is a usual vector bundle. Okay, so the fact is that this vector bundle is, there is already the anti-holomorphic forms which are factored in. So what we will consider are just general superconnections acting on, on this object. So, A second in this case will be an operator of total degree 1. Remember, this E is graded by the sum of the degrees here. 
of total degree 1, which is such that its square vanishes, and it's still compatible with the debar operator in the sense that if you multiply a section by a form, an telomorphic form, then this operator verifies Leibniz's rule with respect to multiplication by antilomorphic forms. So what does this mean, really? So, first of all, this will call the antilomorphic superposition, and if you like, you can write this operator globally now in this way. So these Vs are just morphisms of D. They are morphisms of D, but they are also forms. So Vs of degree 0 is a form, V2 is of degree 2 is a form, V3 of degree 3 is a form, etc. And you have here just nabla d second, which is just a connection. Okay, so you have this whole series. If you like, it's a field with various components, and you request the total degree to be 1. That is, V here increases the degree by 1 in D, nabla d second preserves the degree in D, V2 decreases the degree by 1 in D, so that the total degree is equal to 1. And you request the square to be 0. That's an anti-homotic superconnection. But how, how can total degree be 1 and there can be many terms? It does not terminate? Well, it terminates at some point, because you're bound by the degree by in the forms. Yes? I mean, obviously it terminates. Don't worry. There are no infinities here to renormalize. This terminates. So you have such an operator that obviously this operator commutes with a debar operator. I mean, when you multiply by holomorphic functions, it still commutes with multiplication with holomorphic functions. And I will define H e to be the cohomology of the sheaf, of the sheaf associated with this eight second. So in other words, I take this operator, it's square vanishes. And I want to understand locally what is the cohomology of this category. Okay, that's a more general object than the sort of things I introduced before. Before there were only two terms. Now there are many terms of all possible degrees. So let me state a theorem of block. So this is a theorem of block that he formulated. I mean, and we actually gave a complete proof of this. So what this says is, first of all, that this HE is a covariant sheaf. It's still a covariant sheaf. That is, locally, it's still given by this. You still can go back to the nice example, locally. And there is a second fact, is that all covariant sheaves are obtained this way. OK, so not only these antilomorphic superconnections with many, many terms, Describe covariant sheaves, but conversely, any covariant sheaf can be described in those terms. And so let me just give at least an element of a proof is that locally, after gauge transformation, so you need to understand what is gauge transformation here. The gauge transformation does not act only on the D, that is on the vector bundle, it mixes it with forms. It acts on total space. Sorry? It acts on total space. Yes, it acts. OK, the automorphism of total degree 0. Okay, So you need to understand this. Locally, after gauge transformation, you can go back to the case where you have just two terms. And these gauge transformations are smooth gauge terms. I mean, yes. no, no singularity. No single. Locally, right? Locally. Yeah. They are local. Yeah. So you can go back to these V plus W as same. So that's the exact analog of the Newland-Nuhamberg theorem, which I mentioned at the beginning. At the beginning, any holomorphic connection locally, you can write it as d bar, acting on c to the k. Here's the same thing. Anything with many, many terms, after conjugation, you can reduce it to two terms. And so you go back to the original situation, and so you get the current sheet. Is this the reason why the Donaldson, I mean, Donaldson has to describe those things for his invariants, right? Because we know now very well that the, the gauge theories that are related to it are not theories of bundles, but rather theories of sheaves. That's, Donaldson had that's, to calculate. That's probably the case. That's probably the case. But 
Okay, the remarkable thing here is that, in some sense, the fermionic, the fermionic fields are already present in the description of the sheet. It's not like with vector bundles you can get vector bundle and sheetify with that and so on. Here they are already there. Okay, the reconstruction theorem that all current sheaves are obtained this way, this is also difficult. Okay, so these two stages and in some sense, this local proof consists in, in trying to iterate the construction. We try to kill the degrees of the forms one after the other by successive conjugations until you eliminate everything except the piece of degree zero and one. So, exotic hot theory. Exotic hot theory. So, <laughs> this is just for your amusement if you find it amusing. So you give yourself x to be a complex, complex manifold. And I introduce this threshold of forms, which is just consists in making a change of sign of the forms. So the f1, f1 are just one forms. And so basically, I introduce a pairing between two forms alpha and beta. And this pairing is essentially given by the intersection product. So it's alpha wedge beta bar, but alpha is slightly modified with this funny sign here. And there is a normalizing factor, which is relevant. I mean, which is relevant. OK, so the main fact is that this pairing is non-degenerate, but it is also Hermitian. So it's non-positive, of course it's non-positive, but it is Hermitian. That is, if you exchange alpha and beta, you get the conjugate. Okay, so it's the opposite in some sense of the L2 Hermitian product, which is positive. Here it's a non-positive Hermitian product. And in particular, if you compute the adjoint of the classical D bar with respect to this pairing, what you get is D. So that the corresponding hot Laplacian vanishes. D bar anti commuted with D bar star is zero. So for these sort of bizarre pairings, the Laplacian vanishes. So more generally, in the case of a Chern connection, if you have Nabla E second, you complete its star, it's a joint. <laughs> with respect to this sort of pairing, you get Nabla E prime. So, if you like, then the curvature, Re, of the churn connection, that's a sort of exotic hodge Laplace, in which it's written as the anti-commutator of nabla E second, with its new adjoint, with the adjoint with respect to this area. So, why did I do that? Because in the case of these more general superconnections, we will introduce generalized metrics. So I give, I give myself E, if you like, I write it this way, at the tensor product of anti-holomorphic form tensored with D. I give myself HD to be Hermitian metric on D, just on D. And then, using the previous sort of pairings between forms, I can define the adjoint Superconnection. So in other words, you have the A second, and you take now it's a joint with respect to this sort of bizarre pair. Actually, some some the metrics, if they are properly understood, should be also have components in the exterior algebra. They are not pure metrics, but I suppose that for you it's just children play of understanding of understanding this. So is the notion of a joint superconnection? You can form the sum of the two exactly as you were doing with churn connections. And then I will define the churn character of core and sheaves. Sorry, can you draw that equation again? That went too quickly. Yes? The last one, just you add two. Okay. Oh, you just add them. Okay. Sorry? That equation was just after two seconds. I couldn't process. But it's just the addition of the two. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. Wow. So exactly yeah. like, like, like with connections. Okay, so, so you define suitably the adjoint. 
Okay, with strain connections, you did not need to think of this number prime to be the adjoint surface. Here, you have to be careful with the signs and so on. So, you, 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 need, you need that. You know, somehow, when we, when we try to consider a case when we have a uh, uni what we call universal bundle, product of x times the moduli space of uh, holomorphic bundles, on there, we only take a curvature. We don't care about connection, but yes. we need only curvature. So we assume that there is some super connection yes. with the curvature given, and then we calculate what's called correlation functions of those objects rather than, so we don't need a connection in order to describe uh, invari no invariant <laughs> way. So we say it exists. Yes. And then only what we need. Uh, yeah, but I mean, here we're forced to get curvature. Yeah. Because we describe invariant objects, right? We don't really need the connection yeah. as long as it exists. Yeah, yeah. But, but I mean, you know, this A second, after all, you start with smooth bundles, right? I mean, these D are smooth. There is no holomorphic structure of this D, not at all. Right. But still, there is an underlying sheet which is homomorphic. Yeah, I see. So it's a kind of existence. That yes. There is a such thing exists. Yes. So, so let me just give the theorem we proved that if you take exactly as before, like in the case of Turnville theory, you take the super trace of D of the exponential of minus the curvature, suitably romanized with 2i pi, you get a churn character with values in the bar churn commodity. And this does not depend on the choice of the metric. Okay? It does not depend on the choice of the metric. It's even more refined than that, but I won't give the refinement. And besides, the second thing, so this is a hard statement. The Chi's Chen character induces a Chen character map from this K group. This is a K group of current sheaves now with values in the bot Chen commodity. So it has all the features of the Chen character, including multiplicativity. Okay, there is a multiplication in this current sheaf, which is hard to define, but this construction actually gives you the Chen character. And of course, it extends the churn character on holomorphic vector bundles. If you had the usual holomorphic vector bundle coincided right. with the previous construction. How old, like is this before. How, how old is this result? Sorry? How old is this result? So this result, I would say, is about maybe uh, one year and uh, one month old or something. I mean, maybe, yeah, I would say so. So in uh, 25 years ago, we just assumed this was true. No, no, we didn't know that no, it was I mean, not. People who were calculating Donaldson invariants for non algebraic manifolds were assuming that this is true. You assumed that it was a true character? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Perfect. I mean, you know, if, if dreams are ultimately true, that's fine. That's perfectly fine. But I mean, people have been striving to get such, such a construction. So here's the construction of the Chen character, and in some sense, this fact that there is a Chen character here, that means that there are compatibilities at the level of current sheaves, which I did not describe. Yeah, but what, sorry, sorry. What I was saying was that for algebraic case, we would derive the Donaldson invariance. Oh, wait, wait. For and then we would, case, for and then we would case, assume. To do. Yeah, then we would assume that if it's not algebraic, it's still true. I mean, but you know, in some sense, you were right. I think that, that this sort of inspired. Yes, I mean, yeah, I would have thought. I mean, I wouldn't have exactly done as you, as you did. You were perfectly fine. But in some sense, now you're happy because you know it's true. Okay, okay so we have a chunk correct. So, sorry, a couple of simpler questions. So what is phi? Oh, phi is just a 2i pi normalization. I, I, I did not write it. There is always a 2i pi lingering on to make things okay. real or something. Okay. Uh, and then, so you, you say there is a... Um, there is a churn character with the target, this uh, DC homology. Yes. But you can eventually go to the RAM. If you, you can eventually go to the RAM. So, of course, if you go to the RAM, then the map was already known. Okay. Okay, so all these things with values in the RAM were already done before. There's been a very long literature of trying to do this in the RAM. Why do you, why do you absolutely need to do it in BC? You need to do it in BC because that's where the question, I mean, First of all, the question was asked to me by somebody working in the classification on surfaces, and he asked me whether this result was true or not. 
-hmm. So uh, first of all, I told him it was not true, mm -hmm. and I explained to him why, and then ultimately we proved it was true. But, but what, what's the advantage of having it in BC? So, okay, you have now it in BC, what, what is the mileage? Because for general complex manifolds, that's the more refined cohomology that you can get possible. Okay. okay, this HBC, it's almost as refined a cohomology theory as possible. It's not exactly like the link homology and so on, but all, all very close. Mm -hmm. So it sits really at sort of borderline between purely algebraic and purely analytic. That's something really refined. Mm -hmm. And you will see that you have to fight to get this result. Uh, sorry, there are another thing that uh, was kind of interesting in who takes his blockchain classes and define secondary characteristic classes like. Yes, that's a very go, good question. Descent, to do descent. Yes. And again, we assume, we do for algebraic case, Yes. we define DD bar descent, Yes. Right? and then we assume that it's true always. For secondary classes. I mean, you... you Is you, it true? Yes, so you're cornering here, because you're interested in... What you're interested in is not the class itself, it's just like a Chern Simons class. Not Chern Simons, the other one. I don't know, but with D bar D instead of D. D bar descent for integrals. So yes. we take class and integrals. Absolutely, that's, that's the question of metrics, in some sense that where the metrics lie, I mean, you know. It doesn't depend on metrics. So in this context, this refined theory does not exist well. Okay, ah. you cannot, it does not exist well. So that's precisely, we are in some sense, the thing is not regular enough so that we could take, we could follow the refined classes. But there was another, sorry, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm asking many questions, but I'm very interested, in that, I'm sure. So what, what Ken could have been proved that in the rank of homology, after he introduced complex structure and defined holomorphic structure in the bundle, mm -hmm. there is always a representative which is holomorphic in connection. There is always, sorry? Representative, which is holomorphic in connection. Yes. And corresponds to DD bar descent. So again, take yes. the co-cycles, you know, the class and secondary class and, and go down whatever you can. In each step on descent, you have a derambo, which is well defined. Now we ask question, is, can I add a co-boundary to get a holomorphic representative in a connection if I introduce a complex structure? Answer is yes, and explicit formulas are no. So, holomorphic co-cycles, basically. It could be that the sort of result you're talking about is just a special case, in some sense, of the equivalence I gave before between current sheaves and anti-holomorphic superconnections. Okay, this could be, but at that stage, I don't feel secure. Sorry, may I just interrupt? I'm, I'm very fond of having lively discussions. Maybe we, should, maybe we should work a little bit at a time. So you have 15 more minutes. I mean, would you prefer to just go on and then have the questions? Yes, afterwards? yes, yes, maybe. Yeah, maybe, maybe we should do that then. Yes. OK, so the computations involve things like derived category that Maxim Konsevich maybe talked to you about. I won't say a word about this, about the proof. So, so what is the notion of direct images of current sheets? Okay, so this is really algebraic geometry. So, this is a result of Grauert and Grodem. If you give yourself a holomorphic map from X to Y, which is holomorphic, you can sort of construct this F shriek, which goes from the category of current sheaves to the category of current sheaves, from X into Y. That's the so-called direct image functor. I will try to give a more concrete example of this later on. Yes. So if F is just a submersion from X to Y, so you have a submersion with the fibers. So this direct image refines on the index of the families of fiber-wise D-bar operators. Okay, so this may look cryptic, but just, just to give a hint of what it says. So, on the other hand, if you have a map from X to Y, X compact to Y compact, there is also an integration along the fiber map 
which goes from the Bochum cohomology of x to the Bochum cohomology of y. So this integration along the fiber, I mean, I won't say too much about this, but if you generally have a form and you take its integral along the fiber, okay, if it's a motion, it's also a smooth form. But more generally, if you start from the form, the integration along the fiber is now recurrent. It's now recurrent. It is not smooth. So basically, the fact that there is this integration on the fiber map from Bochum cohomology of x to Bochum cohomology of y is non-trivial. You have to say something. Okay, so I won't say much, but it's the fact that exactly like the Ram cohomology can be defined in terms of currents and not forms, you can also define Bochum cohomology using currents that is non-smooth or it, currents lie in the dual of forms. And so there is this, this functor. Okay, so let me state now the theorem of riemann rohr grothendieck that we proved. Okay, so oh, the riemann rohr grothendieck theorem looked the same if you never saw this. So if I start from a current sheaf in K of X, then we have the classical riemann rohr grothendieck theorem in which you say that, okay, we see, by introducing suitably the Todd the Todd class of Tx and Ty, you get this equality in both cohomology. So again, the image of this result in the Ram cohomology was no. It has been known for many years. The refinement is just recent. So basically, the proof goes by looking at the case of immersions and submersions and using functoriality. But I will just review basically, uh, just give an application. If you give x to be a compact complex manifold and you look at the embedding of the point x in the manifold x, okay. yes, then you find the chain character of the image of the constant sheaf at the point x is just given by the Dirac mass x, which looks like a rather simple result, but in some sense, since there was no definition of term character before, this expected result is a non, sort of non-trivial consequence. Yeah. yeah, actually, I'm a bit confused. What is the statement, actually? I mean, what is delta x? Sorry? I x is just embedded. No, 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 just at the very end. So delta x. Yeah, the Dirac mass. The Dirac mass, you view it as current. It's a current of total degree. Yeah, but you're promising us that it will be in your complex, and this is not in your complex. No, no, this is in Bachelor cohomology now. This delta x is a closed current. Uh, and it defines uh, an element in Bachelor cohomology. No, but the Bachelor cohomology didn't have a delta x in it. You, you, you this is what I told you, that there is a non trivial statement that which allows you to define Bachelor instead of using smooth forms. You can enlarge it to currents. Uh. So, so this is honestly there. Yeah. So this is a quality which is a consequence of what we proved. And because you extend it from the bundles to shifts. Yes. Uh, going from bundles to shift allows you to have delta x. No, no, no. This I know. Yeah, my, but no, no, that's not. In drum cohomology, you could also directly do that. In drum cohomology, but now you you in refined cohomology, and I told you that you can use currents and so on. So, I will now be very quick because I have very little time left. So, we're going to concentrate on the case of submersions. Just look at the submersion and even the simplest case from m equal x to s to projection s. We take a submersion, this p, and we take f current sheaf to be hg. So, we take a current sheaf given already by hg. So, since I have very little time, since I have very little time, let me try to say in words. So I will just leave the transparency now and say it in words, and maybe explain what the difficulty is. 
So I even will assume that E to be a vector bundle to avoid complications with Cohen chiefs up there. If you have a vector bundle up here, you take its direct image, you get in general a sheaf. So what this means is as follows. You take a vector bundle on the total space and you look at the vector bundle along the fibers. And you look at the cohomology of these fibers. So typically, the cohomology jumps. So the cohomology jumps. So if you are in the smooth category, you know more or less how to repair these jumps using smooth category, smooth case theory. If you are in the lomorphic category, then what you get is actually a covariant sheaf. And this is a covariant sheaf that you want to work on. So let me try to explain how will the solution be obtained. I just give a rough idea. So first of all, we're going to use the hot theory along the front and its deformation. Now, what we will do is construct not the Chen character of the Dolbo complex. Try to obtain the Chen character of the family of Dolbo complexes. So what is the Chen character of the family of Dolbo complexes? These Dolbo complexes are now infinite dimension. But it is still equipped with a superconnection. The total D-bar operator, the total space, can be viewed as a superconnection on the base. So you can construct, using analysis, the curvature of the superconnection and its shallow character using the fact that the heat kernel is trace class in the fiber. There is a first result which tells you that this shallow character for using this infinite dimensional Dolbo theory is the shallow character of the direct image in the sheaf theoretic sense. This is a non-trivial statement. Absolutely non trivial. You have a construction which is infinite dimensional, a construction which I explained before by complicated construction using a chunk character, and you want to say this infinite dimensional construction fits with this sort of algebraic construction of chunk character. This is take one. Step two is to try by some limit to get some local quantities like the tall class on the right hand side of the chunk character by some limit. So you have a t-parameter. Typically, you have a t-parameter, so I'm saying that the side of a metric, and you want to make t tend to zero. You want to produce localization in the proper sense. You want to localize this chain character. In general, the localization will not take place. You can prove that it doesn't localize well, except if the metric along the fiber is k or d body closed. In general, it will not be debarred closed. We have non protective case here. We cannot localize. So we are stuck. And I would say we have been stuck because of this for 40 years. The way out of this is to deform the notion of a metric. So I will just say it in two minutes because I know I start at 20 and I'm almost, I know the chairman is looking at me. We have five minutes. We have five minutes, I thought. Okay, maybe I have five minutes. Okay. Five minutes, yeah. Okay, so let me try to explain. Okay, so okay, so severing the Gordon knot. Okay. So this one I explained this before. Okay, so let me now explain how we can solve this. In some sense, I mean, we need first to understand why there's a limit as t tend to zero. As you want the localization parameter to go to zero, why the localization does not take place? Well, it does not take place because in some sense, in the corresponding field theory, we have a supersymmetric Lagrangian. This Lagrangian has a bosonic part and it has a fermionic part. And the bad fermionic part comes from the d bar d of the KL fold. The d bar d of the KL fold will always appear in the supersymmetric Lagrangian. It will not scale properly that it will be divided by t. And so when t tends to zero, the thing explodes. There is unavoidably an explosion. Unless the d bar of k is zero. Except, except when d bar d is equal to zero. So if d bar d is equal to zero, 
of the Kähler form is zero, that's fine. We can do this. Now, what you can check sort of reasoning from it. Okay, now I'm going to play the crazy physicist. <laughs> okay. If the classical energy, if the classical energy, the classical energy is integral of x dot squared, could be replaced by the integral of x dot four. Keeping the Lagrangian supersymmetric you would find that the divergence when t tend to 0 disappears. So what is the problem? The problem is that there is no theory with x dot 4. OK, as you know well, you are not allowed to make x dot 4. So let me explain what is the way out. OK, I'm going to explain what is the way out. It's not described in this way, but the way out is as follows. First of all, we start regularizing the theory. So what means regularizing the theory? That means exactly uh, we introduce in the Lagrangian, in the supersymmetric Lagrangian, an extra term which will contain x double dot square. We regularize it. That corresponds exactly. And we need to regularize it supersymmetrically because the quantity that we want to compute depends on the complex structure, so we have to be very careful in doing this. We introduce this regularization by introducing a big action. This x dot square is much bigger than the original action, which is already a sort of problem. But this can be cured. Now, at that stage, you can try to make the t tend to 0. And in the supersymmetric Lagrangian, the d bar d is still there. So you still have not solved the problem. We still are stuck. But now, with the regularized theory, we are free to introduce, instead of the x dot square, we are free to replace it by x dot 4. In other words, we start with x dot square, and we perturb now the Lagrangian in the regularized theory by interpolating between x dot square and x dot 4. We kill x dot square. This we're allowed now to do, because with x dot to the square, x double dot square, the x dot 4 is well defined. OK, we are in a regularized theory in which the x dot 4 is well defined. But now, in the supersymmetric Lagrangian, the x dot 4 commands a term where there is a d, there is a d bar d, but we are now smoothed out. It's sort of smoothed. And we are now allowed to make the t tend to 0. At that stage, we make t tend to 0, and we get the result. OK, so literally speaking, I mean, I hope to have been sort of, sort of clear. You cannot solve the problem in the original context for basic fundamental geometric reasons. And you need to find a way of going to another field theory in which effectively the asymptotic And, and that procedure does not have restriction on a, on, on a metric, possible metrics on manifold, because you cannot always do such thing if metric doesn't allow some isometries or something like that. No, it's, this is very... Generic. I mean, this can, I mean, this can be done relatively easily. And the metric itself, instead of being the nightmare that it is, for instance, in general relativity, or any problem, it just becomes a field. It's, it just becomes a, a field which can be manipulated relatively easily. So in particular, in the final limit, the scalar form on the base is scaled by, you have the, you, you actually, what you do is enlarge a space. You need to enlarge your original manifold so as to make it bigger. You introduce extra fiber okay. with a tangent bundle. And you play with this Maxwellian approximation. That's what that I used in my previous talk. I mean, that's another version of it. So you enlarge coordinates. You have these extra coordinates. You use the extra space. That you, I mean, the fact that you have now more space to move allows you to get out of the bad genetic situation in which you were before. And if you're far enough from the original geometric situation, you finally can compute the limit and get the theorem you want. The mathematical difficulty is that 
All of this, I said it in words. You need to preserve supersymmetry. You need to preserve, to be sure that your deformation is done modulo d bar d. If you are not caref careful, you just destroy all the, all the toy that you had at the beginning. Okay. So ultimately, this can be done. Okay, and okay, I skip all of this, and I will finish here. Thank you very much.